without further ado, welcome, thanks for coming to IUI, and give a little applause for Ashwin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the, the hardware and software glitches this morning. Uh, so initially I had uh, titled this talk Innovating with AI, but I'm actually going to talk also about interacting with AI, and I do mean the pun there, how you interact with the AI, but how you also interact with things with AI. If you get that, right? Uh, that's my Twitter. If anyone's on Twitter, my LinkedIn's the same. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Google and then lead on to the AI of Google. So people heard of Google? Yeah? No one? Okay. Um, Google's mission from day one has been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. In doing so, over the years, starting with Google Search, which was the first product, we've created eight products that have a billion monthly active users each. Google Drive is the latest to hit a billion. So all of, that, all of these products run in the cloud, right? Maps and, and, and Gmail and YouTube and Chrome and all of that. Google Cloud, which is what I'm with, is a division of Google whose mission is to take all of the innovation Google has done over the last 20 years and make it available to you, Just open it up to the world to use. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that means and how you might use it. The most important innovation in my view, and certainly one of the most in anyone's view, is AI. In fact, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, recently announced that Google is an AI company. Right? Google uses AI everywhere. There are thousands of AI models at work at Google all the time in all of our products, all of our research arms, and even internal operations. And so what I'll do today is so go through the three questions I get the most about AI, which is, how does all this AI work? How does Google use AI? And then how can I do the same thing and use the same kinds of AI in my work? So how does AI work? I think for this audience, uh, I'll, I'll just do a, a very quick intro, because uh, I think folks here know AI and machine learning pretty well. Uh, AI over the decades have gone, has gone through these three big phases where we started with the idea that AI could be built by taking all of human knowledge and programming it into the machine. It would know everything we know and it would be smart. Well, that didn't work that well for a long time. Uh, and so then we said, well, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, let's have machines learn this on their own. And that ran into some issues. And now we have this thing called deep learning, which is a 20, 30-year-old idea that has suddenly come to life. And we'll talk about that as well. So you know, starting at the beginning, the idea behind knowledge systems was, let's start writing rules or procedures or code or, or maybe there are semantic nets, et cetera, to start to encode everything we know. So if you're writing a spam checker, you might rules like, like, uh, write rules like the ones on the left. If you're writing a photo, you're writing Google Photos and you're doing photo analysis, you might write code where you actually write code to go in and get photo elements out of the photograph and do analysis and all of that. The problem with this is that for every spam checking rule we write, there's a spammer out there far smarter than you and I who finds a way to defeat it. Right? We just cannot keep up with the knowledge of the world. The software engineering behind these systems, and more importantly, the knowledge engineering and knowledge management, so getting the knowledge in and keeping it up to date, was a huge human effort and just was no way to do it. So in comes machine learning, and the promise of machine learning was, well, let's not write code and rules to do this. We'll have the machines figure this out. So if you have, for example, a photo, photo app, and you, have, you take a raw image data on the left, you write some code to extract relevant uh, features from that, from that photograph. It might be things like lines and edges and blobs and combinations of those things. And you turn them into a feature vector that you can then classify using your favorite classifier from simple to complex. And out comes the answer. Out comes what this thing is. In this case, the Eiffel Tower. This actually works quite well. The problem is the feature engineering. Most of the time in doing this work, is spent in writing the right set of features. What are the right features to recognize faces or animals? Or if you're doing a different application, you're building an intelligent user interface, you want the user interface to personalize to the user, what, what features of the user would you use? You can do demographic features, age and gender and location and income and so forth. But beyond that, what about all of the psychographic features and all of the preferences and all of the contextual features? 
There's just no way to write the feature extractors to do any of this stuff at scale. So deep learning, the promise of deep learning was the machine would figure the features out as well. You give it the data, and out would come the answer. In the middle, the feature engineering would be done by the machine as well. And this actually works quite well. The way this works is, suppose you're trying to figure out if that's a cat or a dog in your laundry basket. You feed the raw data, the pixels from this image, into the bottom layer of what's called a deep neural network. Most people, I think, have seen these. It's called deep because there are many layers of this thing. It's called a neural network that is sort of loosely modeled after the human brain. It's not really like the human brain, but it's kind of inspired. Uh, and so each dot in this layers, in these, let in these layers, is, a, is what we call a neuron. It's a very simple computing unit that takes its local data and performs a very simple calculation on it and feeds that onto the next layer, which then combines these little chunks of local data coming in and does the same thing and so forth until eventually you get, in this case, there's a dog in there. What's interesting about these networks is if you start to get into the intermediate layers, these networks are discovering the same features you would be programming by hand, a similar features sometimes, uh, things like edges and combinations that are relevant for image recognition. So these networks are sort of discovering features, uh, not always human interpretable, but they are features, and they do help us learn functions like these ones. So at the top we have, uh, if you feed it pixels, like a picture of a monkey, output is a classification. That's like the Eiffel Tower example. That's a function that a neural network can learn. Uh, second, second row across, uh, they can learn audio functions. You can feed it sound patterns from human speech and out comes the text that the human has just spoken. And that's a learnable function. You can feed in text and out comes text in another language. That's a learnable function. You can also feed in pixels and get descriptions of the image. In this case, there's a blue and yellow train traveling down the tracks. And that can be learned by these, these kinds of functions. You can start putting these together. Here's a project that we are working on with the Vatican. You can start putting the image recognition and the language capabilities together into applications like this, and so transcribe these centuries-old manuscripts automatically, and so recognize and turn them into written text. There are many different kinds of deep learning models. There's convolutional networks, which are good for spatial reasoning and vision tasks. There's long short-term memory, often used in language type tasks, recurrent neural networks, which are used in sequential tasks where there's sort of time series data coming in, many, many other types. At Google, we are doing research actively in deep learning. This is by no means a solved problem. It's a very wide area of research. Uh, we're working on learning to learn, transfer learning. Transfer learning is you take a model trained on one problem and you transfer it to the other, another problem. You don't have to learn it again with a lot of data. So when we take Google Home into a new country, for example, you can transfer learn the language of the new country without having to go start from scratch. Hyperparameter tuning and so forth, I'll talk about that a little bit. So AI is already seeing a huge amount of benefit. Uh, these are some of the kind of social impact projects that Google works on. Uh, we are doing a lot of work with disease detection, a lot of work in uh, improving farm productivity, traffic, and so forth. Uh, Google, uh, we can also solve the very first AI problem I ever worked on. Back in my grad school days at Yale, uh, Chris Hammond was working, uh, building this program called Chef that would invent recipes. Um, well, AI can, deep net networks can learn this problem, and these recipes are actually quite good by, by, human, by human standards. So what, neural networks is like 20, 30 years old? Why now? What's happened in the last five years or so? The big difference has been in the 90s and 80s, the compute power and the scale that we could run these networks on wasn't large enough to be better than other approaches, you know, other approaches being your favorite other AI approach. Now, our, our compute has gone up so dramatically that these networks are working at a vast scale and able to do things much better, in many cases, better than even humans. I'll show you some examples of that. So that's kind of a quick primer on AI. Um, so what do we do with AI at Google? Now, as I mentioned earlier, we use AI everywhere in all of our products. We even use it in our own internal operations. So the data centers, I'll show you a picture one, that run Google AI are cooled through AI, uh, but, and the, con the cooling systems are controlled by AI controllers. And we, by doing that, we've actually reduced our energy consumption by 40% in 
Google has been carbon neutral for 10 years. And a lot of that is the magic of AI. So I'll, I'll show you a few of these examples. I think for this talk, I picked examples where, which are really about interacting with AI, where we're looking at the human senses, uh, things like seeing or hearing, and seeing how we might do that with AI. I think that's probably most relevant for user interfaces. So you start with the search, Google search, the oldest product. Google search uses hundreds of signals to identify the best search results for you in a fraction of a second. The biggest improvement in Google search of the last two, three years has been through a deep neural network called Rank Brain, which provides the most important signal to rank a search result. Uh, we can actually, if you type in a search result, we can predict which result you would be most interested in, you personally would be most interested in, with over 80% accuracy. And that's done through machine learning. We use Google to listen to you. Uh, so 20, 25% of our searches are now done through voice, uh, particularly in uh, many foreign countries. And uh, that requires a whole series of AI models. We have to understand your speech signal turn into text. We have to understand the text and figure out what you're asking. And then we have to go find the right results, set of results. We have to rank the best one and then s find a snippet of that and speak it back to you in reasonably natural sounding English or whichever language you asked in. So many, many AI models there. You can actually now start conversing with these AIs. If you can ask questions, they can answer back. So I don't know if people have seen this. I'll show you like a quick clip of this thing that uh, we showed last year. Hopefully we have sound on this. Can we turn the volume up a little bit? Oops. Okay, I need to start this over. PC doesn't work. The, the, the speech production now in AI systems has become virtually indistinguishable from human speech. And here's, here's a demo that we did last year. This is actually now available to you as a product. You can actually use it yourself. Start over. I'm going to exit it. Yeah, go ahead. I'll stop it here in the interest of time. But basically, you can notice not only is the Google Assistant on the left speaking naturally, but also is able to understand fairly ungrammatical English with topic switches, et cetera, on the right. This actually works. And it works across these kind of reservation type domains. Uh, there's also another application now where Google Assistant will answer your phone call for you if you have a call from a number you don't recognize, and will ask what you're calling about and will tell you so that Basically, you can screen your calls. And in a, in a sort of very natural and, and human-like manner. OK, let's see. This is the way to continue. Oh, OK, no, I don't want to do that. OK, I just use this. 
So when you can listen for voices, you can also listen for other kinds of voices, like bird voices or other kinds of sounds in the environment. This is a project in New Zealand to try to find and catalog, catalog threatened birds. And this is all, again, done through the same kinds of deep learning models. Um, we can see with AI, uh, Google Photo. If you're like me, you have tens of thousands of photos in your photo library. I gave up cataloging and putting them into albums years ago. I just can't. Uh, AI will do that for me now. So when you take a photograph, Google Photos automatically understands the scene and tags it for you. And so it knows this is a scene of a beach, and there's boats, and there's water, and sun umbrellas. And so you can say, you know, show me photos of the beach I went to with my daughter last summer. Up comes this photo. And the reason it finds it is I didn't have to tag it as being beach. The photo automatically recognized this. It can also describe a scene. You know, this is a person flying uh, on a beach flying a kite. So I can ask Google, show me photos of people flying kites, and this picture will come up. And all, again, all this happens automatically. You take a photo, and a few seconds later, it's there for you. So this can also be used out in the wild. Uh, for example, another example of photos in the wild with wild animal uh, conservation efforts. And we can do this with very high accuracy. The big change that has happened in the last six or so years, seven years, has been the advent of deep learning has led to the reduction of error rate. So as early as sort of 2011, 2012, a machine learning, state-of-the-art machine learning system had about a 26% error rate, which is much, much worse than humans, which are about a 5% error rate. Now these systems are better than humans in recognizing sort of natural images out in the wild. And this is a couple of years ago, right? By, by today, it's even better. We can apply this to videos. So far, you can try this yourself. You go online, you upload a bunch of videos, and you can search your videos. You can say, find me videos with cars in them. Let's see if I can find this thing here, right? And up comes all of the videos in this collection with cars. These little red dots tell you where the cars occur. And some are pretty obvious, some are not so obvious, but it'll find them again. All happens instantly and automatically. You can also have it look at a single video and tell you that this has an ocean and water and beach, and then later on in the, there's a skyline with, of a city and so forth. Oh, this picture has not come out, but uh, so you can also use this for sketching type uh, activities. So if you want to have a sketching interface, uh, if you go to Google Quick Draw, which is online, you can try it. You, you sketch on the on your computer or on your phone, and the AI will sort of guess what you're sketching. It's kind of like a real-time Pictionary, and the accuracy is super high. Uh, sorry, the image didn't come out. It's basically a picture of someone sketching. Uh, writing with AI. Uh, about 12 to 15% of responses on Gmail and text messaging are now created by AI. And it's not autocorrect of a word. Uh, it actually, you know, so for example, you have a vacation pr uh, plan set, when can you do, uh, send them along? I'm most likely off the week, you know, so it, it knows phrases or in, sometimes even entire sentences and completes them for you. And you just sort of accept or, or you, can, you can go over that. So under the hood, the machine learning systems are doing what we were trying to do by hand, right? The classical NLP, you did all of this kind of tokenizing and pre-processing and all of the modeling effort to try to get things like entities and translation of topics and so forth. We get the same outputs, but all of this internal stuff that we used to program are now being learned by these machines. And that's, I think that's been the big sea change. You can start combining these modalities. You combine photos and language and you get translate. One of the Impressive things about Translate is it works on this device, on a phone, without Wi-Fi. It's actually working locally on your phone. And, there's a, uh, and the reason is that, I'll show you this in the, in the, later in the talk, uh, we have a way to take a, a very large, complex TensorFlow model created through machine learning and then shrink that into a very small, lightweight, low power consumption model that is almost as accurate. It can run on an edge device, any kind of device. You can also do this with voice. So you can use the Google Translate uh, function. You can use Google Assistant or your headphones to speak in one language and have the other person hear in a different language, say French. If you speak in French, I hear it back in English. This happens in real time. You can do that across dozens of languages now, again, on your phone. 
So if you think about these kinds of applications, right, we've been working on IUI for years, um, although the conference is, uh, is, is, you know, has evolved a little bit, and we kind of think of intelligent user interfaces as being very simple, natural, kind of smart about how they interact with us. I think the two big changes that are coming, and this is about the time to, to, that we are seeing them, one is the integration across different products and technologies. So for example, you can say to Google Assistant, show me photos from last weekend, and up comes my photos. So this is now combining Google Assistant and Google Voice Search and Google Photographs or Photos into one experience. The user doesn't have to know. They just interact with three different products. It's just one request, you get an answer. So that's gonna, the integration is, be, is becoming much easier and leading to really magical experiences. The other big thing that's coming is Ubicomp, Ubiquity. When this starts happening out in the world around us, right? so at home, for example, I can say, I don't even have to pick up my phone, I can say, hey, Google, I hope it doesn't trigger anyone's Google, hey, Google, you know, show me photos from last weekend or show me photos of that church we went to in Germany last year or whatever. On my, on my television, the Google Home will send a query to Google, find my photos, turn on my television, and show me my photographs. I don't have to even get up from my couch. And again, the integration and the fact that it's ambient and in the environment for me all the time is hugely powerful. It's my car, it's in my home, it's in my phone, it's everywhere, right? So if you think about the interface part of IUI, right? We used to think of interfaces as being interfaces to, uh, to apps or to websites, right? And then we said, okay, maybe it's an interface to a product. It really is now an interface to the world around us. This is an easy, natural way for us to interact with our, the world we live in. And I think that's the direction that IUI is going in. And there's been a lot of good work here in this community. I saw some very interesting papers and uh, posters yesterday just get, uh, getting at this issue. Uh, a couple more examples, and then we'll sort of talk about uh, how you can take advantage of this. Uh, so this is uh, some work done at uh, UW on real-time object detection. It uses the same kinds of techniques. We have some internal demos as well. So this is just uh, real-time labeling in a video. And this is, again, you know, it's not sp speeded up or anything. And it's quite impressive if you look at the complexity of the scenes and the kinds of things that are being tagged. Uh, I think there are a couple other, there, so they go on with other examples. This is available at that URL if you want to play with it. And the core, is this also open source? I think that one of the other big things is uh, we've been a, a big driver of that at Google as well, but many folks in the community are open sourcing their work. Uh, so this stuff is available, it's open source. TensorFlow, which is a, uh, something we were doing internally, is now, you know, it's the most used machine learning platform. It is open sourced by Google and extended by many people. So uh, together, the community at large, all of us are able to create a lot more than us working in silos. Okay, so let's move on with this one. Uh, here's another example, lip reading. You could do real-time lip reading at very high fidelity now with the same, again, combining, so, uh, uh, combining the video capabilities and the language capabilities and putting that all together. That's basically you're looking at a, a recurrent network, LSTM, coupled with attention mechanisms and so forth. Uh, you know, not get into the technical stuff here as much, but these kinds of capabilities are available. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a view from a Waymo car. This is you know the car driving down. This is what the car is seeing as it goes. And so doing uh, categorization in real time. Waymo has, cars have driven 10 million miles on public roads without a driver now. It's completely autonomously. Couple that with billions of miles of simulated driving. Uh, there's a very interesting paper from the team called CarCraft uh, on the so simulation environment they use to create real t real realistic scenarios to train these machines on. They're now licensed to drive autonomously in uh, two or three states. Uh, in Arizona, you can actually call a Waymo on your phone and have a self-driving car pick you up. And it's coming soon to California as well. And if you look at, again, the breakthrough that made this happen, uh, just 
as recently as 2015, right? three years ago, four years ago, if you were in a Waymo car driving down that street, this is what the car would be seeing. It's not good enough to drive with, right? I wouldn't be in this car. Fast forward two years, that's what the car sees. Right? You can see the pedestrians, you can see the pedestrian crossing, the traffic lights, the storefronts, and now it's 2019, these things, and you know, you've seen already that image recognition is now exceeding human capacity. Uh, these systems are really, really good. Okay, so that's sort of a quick snapshot, and there I can I can spend a whole hour just showing you examples of Google AI, but uh, let's move on to more stuff. Uh, so I, I mentioned that deep learning doesn't have these bottlenecks, right? You don't have to do knowledge engineering, you don't have to do feature engineering. So is there a problem? What's the bottleneck in deep learning? Or are we home? Data, yeah, black box, explainability, right? So one of the big issues in constructing these systems, I was getting more at the authoring side, is what is called architecture engineering. The neural networks, like in the lip reading example, the snippet I showed you, are very, very complicated. And it requires a lot of expertise to construct the right neural networks and put it all together to train these models and to tweak the high, what are called hyperparameters, all of the sort of transfer functions and all, all the various parameters that make these things run and get it to all work just right. In fact, the big bottleneck in deep learning is it requires deep expertise. This is Jeff Hinton, he's a Google fellow, he's one of the inventors of deep learning. There aren't enough Jeff Hintons for all of us, there aren't even enough for Google, right? How do we, how do we solve this problem? There's a, the, the job market in this area, these areas has really exploded. There just isn't enough talent. And so we you know, think about this a little bit differently. We don't want everybody to become a machine learning PhD, I think that would defeat the purpose. Can we have AI solve the problem? AI did feature engineering for us, it did knowledge engineering, but can it also do architecture engineering? We call that AutoML. So the idea is when you're doing machine learning, you're starting with some data and you have to now prep the data, you may still do some feature engineering, you may not, you have to select these models, train them, tune the parameters, all of this stuff. AutoML is you give it data, out comes a model, literally just a button press. Could we do that? So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is very new, this has all come out now just in beta. If you want to play with it, it's now just available. But uh, if you give you a couple of examples of this, AlphaGo, you've probably seen AlphaGo. This was an AI system that was built at Google that learned to play Go well enough to defeat Lee Sedol, uh, who was the cha world champion then, and then other sort of world grandmasters. And Go has more moves than the number of atoms in the universe, clearly a super hard problem. So what's interesting here is the AI learned to play Go, but constructing the AI required months of effort by a team of machine learning experts at DeepMind. This was a huge effort to construct the AI, and then it eventually learned to play this. We have now AlphaGo Zero that learns AlphaGo. So in three days, AlphaGo Zero plays Go as well as the version that beat Lee Sedol, right? And so it didn't take months of human effort to do this. In 21 days, it's playing at master level, and at, 40, in the, at the end, it ends up at 40 days later of just training. AlphaGo Zero is playing Go better than any known human or machine, right? It's basically the best Go player ever, completely autonomously. How does this work? Basically, it's doing architecture engineering. It's doing a search. We call it neural architecture search. There's a neural network that's searching through the space of neural architectures, trying different ones, ruling out the bad ones, and so doing this search towards the best architecture. And it performs handcrafted models. This is back to the vision world where a lot of this stuff started. This is sort of state of the art in image recognition from things like MobileNet and ShuffleNet, all of the inception models, ResNet, et cetera, that were created by experts. There's AutoML. It's doing better than the best human models at the, at the sort of the large end as well as the small end. Another interesting thing is that the, the, the system can learn a vast range of functions. So we learn not just to play Go, you can play Shoji, you can play chess, 
You can also, also learn functions that don't look very game-like, but are. So this is an inside view of one of our data centers. One of the problems we deal with is a massive amount of cooling required to keep these places cool. So what we did was we modeled cooling a data center as a game, where you win the game by reducing cooling energy. We've got 40% reduction. AlphaGo is happy, AlphaGo Zero is happy to learn this game as well, just like it learned Go. And this happens again completely aut autonomously, doing much better than the best human-crafted control systems we had at the time. Okay, so that's sort of the end of the tour. I'll just end with this slide, which is uh, AI has a huge amount of potential. It's already making massive impact. And there's also risk with any new technology. So at Google, we've adopted a set of AI principles. Uh, these have been endorsed by the leadership team. We want to make sure we will only create AI that is socially beneficial, avoid bias, is safe, is accountable, is private, and has high standards of scientific excellence. And then finally, also make this AI available for other users as long as they are in accord with these principles. So, and that's where sort of it makes it comes. The Google Cloud comes in, making it available to all of you. That's where open source comes in as well. So that's sort of how Google uses AI. So now the question is, okay, so you want to do this kind of AI? What do you do? So let's look at what it takes to quote do AI. These are sort of the building blocks of AI, right? So you need data. Um, Shivali mentioned data earlier, right? Huge amounts of data, user data, application data, usage data, there's batch data, structured data. I mean, there are all kinds of data, right? You have to now build models with that data. You have deep net networks, convolutional networks, recursive networks. Knowledge graphs, uh, knowledge hasn't gone away. There's just there's machine learning deep models, but you also want to couple in knowledge graphs, and you have to learn these knowledge graphs because we couldn't program them by hand. <laughs> for all these different modalities, vision, speech, audio, et cetera. We have to secure all of this stuff because this is hugely valuable information. It's private information, right? Uh, Google actually has this open challenge. If you can hack a Google system or find a bug, you get a nice cash prize. And we have thousands of people trying to hack us every day because we want to see if there's any bugs and find them. Uh, and then you need infrastructure at a huge scale, and so I want to show you a little bit of this infrastructure and then how you can get to it. Uh, Google has what we call a planetary scale computer. Uh, this is one data center. It's the size of several football fields. Some of them are size of small towns. They're inside, if you go inside of them, there's sort of banks upon banks of computers. And they're connected across the world with a, with a high-performance fiber network, the, Public internet is, you know, has issues with latency and reliability and you know, competing traffic, et cetera. Uh, and so if you want to get a YouTube video to someone across the world in a fraction of a second, it's got to go there at light speed and with nothing in the way. So we actually carry 25% of the world's internet traffic. So that is the computing platform. All of those data centers across the world connected up this way on which Google AI runs. Why does this matter? Why do you need all of this? So this curve is super interesting. If you look at the best AI model of over time on a log scale, so it's starting with things like AlexNet, and we had sequence to sequence models, uh, exception, and then AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero at the top end right now. And there'll be something better coming soon, I'm sure. Or there's neural machine translation, which does all of the translation stuff I mentioned. The compute required to run the state-of-the-art AI is doubling every three and a half months. Remember Moore's law? Computers double every 18 months. AI has far outstripped the ability of our computers to keep up. It's just we're not going to build systems fast enough. Right? Jeff Dean, who's one of our most senior fellows, head of Google AI, he says if everyone spoke to their phone for three minutes, we'd exhaust all available computing resources. Right, if we want to get everyone onto voice interfaces, we've got to deal with that, right? So what, what we've done is we've started building this infrastructure from the ground up. Google builds everything. We built our chips. We built all of the servers there. We don't buy anything. We build them ourselves. We build the storage. We build the networks. Part of the reason we build everything is for security. Every card in every server in every rack has a security chip. 
My phone has a security chip in it. You can't fish it. My, my laptop has a security chip. Applications have security chips. Everything is secure because it's super important. And partly security, partly it's also so speed and reliability and all of that. Uh, so inside of these, we have these uh, chips called TPUs. Of course, we use CPUs and GPUs, graphic processing units, as well. T TPUs are tensor processing units. They're basically chips optimized for TensorFlow. And there's a ver version of that. We, if you go to um, g.co, which is Google company, slash Oscar, you'll see we've just announced boards and even USB sticks with TPUs on them. You can use them in your own applications. There's a version of a TPU type tip in, in here that lets you run these models, right? So let's get these things out in small form on the edge as well, as well as into our banks of servers. These, these things are, have a quadrillion fold improvement over current state of the art. So at the sort of Moore's law doubling uh, phenomenon, we are about seven years in the future right now. We take a bank of these things, uh, and, and it's all available, by the way, to all of you, and I'll show you how you get to it. So that's where Google Cloud Platform comes in. If you go to cloud.google.com, log in, it's free. There's a very generous free tier for all of the stuff out there, for academic research, for teaching, for students. It's all free anyway. So use it. It's everything you saw, you can use, and it's free. So how you use AI? Focus on your work. Do your research, build your applications, do your interfaces, and use our AI, use our infrastructure. It's there for you. Right? So many companies are using it. So the, Google, the business of Google Cloud is making this available to other companies like uh, Iron Mountain, eBay, Rolls Royce. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of companies now using Google AI in some form or the other. Uh, the, the, we think of this as democratizing AI. If you think about you know, this whole problem of, of, of uh, deep expertise, very few people today can actually create an AI model. There may be a few thousands of deep learning researchers. There are a, a few millions of data scientists. Um, they're pretty good. They're not coders necessarily. Some of them are. But we want them to be able to do machine learning as well, just as well as the machine learning experts. There are tens of millions of developers, just software engineers, who can build stuff. Um, we want to make AI available to them as well. So the way we do this is through the Google Cloud AI platform. If you go to cloud.google.ai, you'll see a set of infrastructure. You'll see building blocks, and you'll see solutions. So the infrastructure layers, I think of it as three layers. You get all of the same uh, storage, the networking, the CPUs, the GPUs, the compute engines, all of the stuff we use. You can have it too. It's all there. So you, you log in. You say, give me a machine with a four GPUs and blah, terabytes of memory, and a, throw in a couple of TPUs. You wait a few seconds, and it's there, and you're sitting at your browser working on a supercomputer. Next level up, we have all of the tools and platforms we use are also available to you. So there's a bunch of stuff that we've open sourced, like TensorFlow, and a lot of the work that went into things like Spark and Beam and other things that you, you've seen. There's also things we use internally, the machine learning engine, where we train and, and host our models. Uh, BigQuery is interesting. This is our, our giant data warehouse. So imagine if you had a, a, imagine a spreadsheet with thousands of rows and millions of columns with petabytes of data in it. We can run queries against that in seconds. This thing can ingest 100,000 rows a second of data and do some real-time queries. It would take you, that would normally would have taken you a weekend. We, we use that constantly in our own business. It's all available to you, data lab and so forth. And then at the highest level, if you don't want to even mess with machine learning engine and train a TensorFlow model yourself, you say, you know, I like what Google Photos is doing. Can I just use the photo model you've already built? That's the API layer. So our, our, you know, the, the vision models, the video intelligence, speech, language translation, all of this stuff, just like you in the old days, you could call Google Search as an API or Google Translate as an API. All of this stuff is available as an API. You can call the Translate API and get, get translation back and go in your merry way. You're using the same translation models we do. So the way you use this is you look at your application and you mix and match the building blocks that you need. If you're doing data analytics, 
you're going to want to ingest data, you'll explore it probably with BigQuery, you prepare it, you then train a model, tune, etc. And there's tools for each one, you sort of plug them all together and, and do that. If you're doing marketing, this is actually an internal example. This is how we do marketing when you're trying to get people to sign up for G Suite or other things. We take all of the data that's coming in and we feed them uh, typically into BigQuery. Uh, data flows a way to get data from both batch and real-time streaming sources and combine them together using one piece of code so you don't have to write code twice. Um, train a model and so forth, and then that's what powers things like ads and so forth. Right? So again, the, the idea here is not the detail here, but take these blocks and mix and match them together and make an application. You're doing an edge application, maybe it's a smart home or maybe it's other kind of IoT. Uh, you're going to want to take IoT devices, plug them into IoT core. Uh, PubSub gives you the streaming data back into data flow, train a model, and do the analytics. And it's literally just all building blocks. It's, it's like Lego blocks, very simple. Um, another thing we've, uh, that you can now get to is, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about doing AI at large scale. We also do AI at small scale. I mentioned this earlier with the TPUs. Right? So this is the, it's, it's called uh, Learn to Compress, and there's a blog on this online. If you Google it, you'll see it, um, where you can take a big complex TensorFlow model, compress it into something that will work on a phone or some very small, simple edge device. You can run it on Raspberry Pi or anything like that as well. And it's, it's small, fast, and, and you lose a little bit of accuracy, but not substantially. So you can now combine that. We've just announced ubiquitous AI. Uh, and uh, that's the g.co slash Oscar, where you can take the same kind of IoT workflow, and then on the device you have, maybe it's a camera, maybe it's a Google Home type device, maybe it's a phone, it's a robot, it's a kid's toy, whatever thing you're interfacing with, you can actually embed ML directly in there. So it can run locally very fast without necessarily having Wi-Fi connectivity. And you can build this, you know, a lot of applications. We are working with people building smart factories. There are a lot of people doing smart devices for homes and other things. And you can do conversational UIs as well. Uh, I, I think a number of you are using Dialogflow. I saw some posters on this yesterday, uh, where if you want to create a conversational interface, like some of the ones I showed you, um, Dialogflow is available. Again, it's free. You go and you say, here's what the, I want the interaction to be like and the system learns the AI for you and builds the models for you automatically. So that's kind of the, the, the vision here. You know, so build your own AI loop. Right? Take, take a tool for data ingestion, data preps, some kind of database storage thing, depending on what you need. Explore it, analyze it, do the machine learning, and off you are up and running and going. Right? So at Google, so that's kind of a, how you would use it, right? Log into cloud.google.com. And there's lots of t tutorials that you can get through in 15 minutes, hands-on, code it up, try it out. So at Google, there's, we have this, this culture where anytime you do anything and it looks successful, the management will ask you, could you 10x this? Right? And that's how when Google Fiber was, was launched, right? it's like it was pretty good, it's that fast as the internet, can we go 10x? Right? Whatever it is. So when we look at this picture and saying we're going to reach tens of millions of developers, can we 10x that? Can we reach hundreds of millions of non-developers, business professionals, regular people? Could they do AI? Could we reach a billion end users? Right? Could someone actually using a, a Google application do their own AI just as an end user, not even a developer, not even in business? How do you 10x this? So here's an example, and this is kind of a preview of where we are going. Some of this stuff is available, some is coming. Uh, so, you know, for example, I'm an insurance adjuster, and I'm sent out on the, f on the field by an insurance company, and my job is to figure out how much damage there is. So I go out there, and I have to take notes, and I take pictures, and I figure this out. Could I train, could I not use an AI to do this? Could I train an AI to do this myself? Could I do the AI myself, right? <coughs> So there are a few ways where you can do AI. Um, if you have, if you're a database person, you know how to write SQL, you can actually write machine learning code directly into SQL. And we have augmented SQL with a command to create a model. So you can say, I want to create an accent model where I can take the speed and car and how bad the accent was, et cetera, and predict from that 
the damage or predict something. You just, it's literally just adding a keyword into SQL and off you go. You can actually do a lot of smart queries now in Google Sheets in our spreadsheet directly as well. You don't have to write Google spreadsheet formulas. You can just ask your Google spreadsheet a question that will construct a formula for you. You can do Google uh, AI in a notebook. So a notebook is a, like a Google Doc, except you can have text and code in the same doc. So if you go into uh, you know, at this site, and it's also on cloud.google.com, um, you can say, give me, uh, so you could go here, you say, new notebook, and you get this thing where you've written code, and the code actually runs directly in your browser. You don't have to install anything. And you can also just write text. And many of our own tutorials are written with a notebook. So you can just explain something, and there's a piece of code where you can code it and try it yourself. So that's, that's super easy. A lot of people, a lot of students are using this. Uh, many universities have adopted this because it's, you know, it's, again, it's a very simple way of teaching coding. You can do AI, you can also do Python and other things in these notebooks. You can run AI in your browser. So back to this example of image recognition. This is, you know, if you upload a bunch of images to, uh, to the Google Cloud platform, it will train a model for you. So if you know, you know so here's sort of how it works. Let's say I'm training image, uh, a bird recognizer. I train a bunch of images. This is a flamingo. That's an ostrich, et cetera. I do add images. I can add more images to this. And then there's a button here called train. So I click train. And what it does is it takes all of that data you put in, pushes it out to a deep network on the back end. You don't have to see what's going on sends it out to one of these massive clusters, chugs it for you, and back comes a model, and now you have a system that can recognize birds. So if you can upload files to a browser, you can do AI. I have high schoolers doing this stuff for projects. It's super easy. So that's kind of the mission of uh, Google Cloud AI, which is the team I'm on, which is can we democratize AI by making it fast, accessible, and useful for enterprises, developers, and really now end users as well. So that's kind of, kind of what, what I work on. So if you're interested in any of this, um, I'll just put this all up. There's sort of three ways to get involved in this effort of democratizing AI. One is join the, join the team. Uh, that's the site where we, if you want to do research, you want to build products, you want to build interfaces, user experiences, uh, we have internships for students. We have also residencies for students, grad students, which are kind of like a sabbatical for a student for half a year or a year, uh, embedded with the Google Brain team, for example. We have sabbaticals, of course, for professors. We have job openings for fresh graduates, undergrad, grad, people with lots of experience, the whole, whole shebang. You can use the AI, and I mentioned a couple of times now, go to cloud.google.com. You can use it for your research, for your teaching, it's free. You can do it, there's a Google Cloud for startups if you're creating a company. Uh, there's a very generous free, free tier for startups as well. And then if you're building products and applications, the pricing is, is actually very simple. You, you, you pay per second of use. It's sort of a, a fraction per second per use. So if you have, uh, if you have a company whose, uh, let's say, user base goes up and down with the season, maybe it's an education company and no one's working on the weekend, or it's a shopping site and you get spikes around Black Friday, user, your traffic goes up, you pay a little more, your traffic comes down, you pay a little less. You don't have to sort of buy a big machine and pay for that excess capacity. So you can use all of that. And you can also collaborate. We have a lot of collaborative projects. We have research funding for professors. Uh, we have challenge grants. We have other kinds of just, we have lots of projects, a lot of papers published where we have people at Google and people not at Google working together on things. The lip reading work was an example of that. Um, and we are looking for, you know, people working on really cool applications in business, science, robotics, I mean, you name it. It's, AI is at the point where it's come of age. And with the right interfaces, which you all know a lot more about than I do, we can really put this to use and make a difference in a good way at, at massive scale now. And that's sort of the opportunity that I see ahead of us. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you. That's my LinkedIn. If you want to get in touch with me later, it will ask you for my email. 
There's an easy way to get my email. You have to Google it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ashwin. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. So there's already one here. Before, before we uh, jump in, say your name and your affiliation, please. Shivali is always quick on the draw. <laughs> I'm Shivali from Park. And given your sort of background and knowledge, representation, and reasoning, I think you are the right person to bring this question up. So whenever I go to like Google AI talks, there's always a lot of talk about deep learning and all the AI methods and all the machine learning methods that Google is developing. But like there's the other part, the representation and reasoning part, right? So search wouldn't work as well without the knowledge graph. Or the autonomous cars, Waymo, um, they're not end-to-end -end deep learning systems, but the vision part is done with deep learning, but then they do build up the entire sort of the perception hierarchy and the execution hierarchy on the other sides. So I was just wondering like, if you could just explore that a little bit, like how is Google thinking about those yeah. methods? So the, the Broadly speaking, two sets of problems in, uh, in knowledge graphs. So I fully agree with you, deep learning by itself won't solve the entire problem. Um, and we do have to bring knowledge in. So the question is, you know, how do we do that? So there, the two problems are, one is you have to build up the knowledge graphs. How do you build these knowledge graphs, given that you can't hand construct them? The other problem is how do you then bring them together with deep learning to get problems solved, right? Because again, by themselves, they won't be sufficient, but neither will deep learning. How do you match them? So we're working on both those aspects. Uh, we've just, uh, just a few weeks or months ago, we've launched something called Knowledge Services on Google Cloud, again, if you want to try it, which is uh, uh, partially machine, uh, deep learning, partially non-deep learning approach to learning a knowledge graph for your application areas. Uh, so we have a lot of people with, you know, you have documents or you have other sort of specialized ontologies and this system will go learn a knowledge graph for you or take our knowledge graph and augment it for your application area. Uh, so, one, so that's sort of one thread of research is how do we get better at learning knowledge graphs. The other is how do we combine that with deep learning and that's uh, very much an open area of research. We have folks working on it actively, there are a few papers uh, out there. Uh, there are also papers from other, uh, other universities as well, looking at bringing them together. Um, I think some of the promising approaches, uh, you know, the, uh, I think that sort of the, the work in uh, uh, neural Turing machines is very promising. If you think of a, a Turing machine of the old days, right, they had the tape and you could write stuff out. These neural networks, could we also add a tape to a neural network and provide state and memory and a place where it could write out what it knows and read it back in later? Right, so that's at a very architectural level. There's work going on at higher levels as well, where we draw inferences from both knowledge and uh, uh, deep learning and bring them together. So Google Assistant, when you talk to it, you're actually using both knowledge graphs and deep learning on the back end. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on, but it's a wide open area, I think. It's a very, very early. Deep learning itself is barely five years old in terms of really coming to, you know, coming to maturity. And it'll take, it'll take a lot more research from folks like you to solve this problem. Hi. Hi. So I'm Ron Artstein from USC ICT, just down the road here. Yep. Um, uh, since we were at IUI, I wanted, you talk a lot about how you learn to model one thing from another, but where does the user come in? Where, and I'll give you an example, a, a Google application that I use a lot here in LA, living on the other side of LA and coming here almost every day is uh, Google Maps. And I use it not because I don't know the roads, I know them very well, but because I don't know what traffic's gonna be ever, so modeling the traffic. And I find that its model of my preferences is really, really bad. Uh, and uh, I, just this morning when I was driving, I was like, have Google Maps here, I try not to look at it too much because I am aware, trying to look at the other cars. It's, I don't drive an autonomous car. Not yet. Not yet. And uh, yeah, and I see and it gives me a decision to say, oh, route A is going to be uh, five minutes slower than route B. And I'm like, I have enough experience with Google Maps to know it's making the wrong recommendation here. I'm going to route close and in the end, I'm right. Uh, so how do you model what the user wants? OK, so uh, it's actually multiple questions rolled into one. So in all the products that we use, uh, particularly the consumer-facing products, you know, with the billion users each, 
they're all user-facing products, and the learning happens with user data, uh, anonymized for privacy and aggregated, but it is the, the users that feed in the raw data on which the models get trained in some form or the other. And uh, so the users are, are critical to this, to, to this pipeline. There are these systems, I mean, in, in Go, you can go play a game by yourself, but in, none of these, in all of these applications, you actually need people to interact with the system. And we rely on the fact that we have a lot of people interacting with the system uh, to provide the raw data. Uh, in terms of how best to personalize the experience of a particular application like Maps to you or to a particular user, that's, uh, so we are working on that across all of the products, but different products, uh, uh, teams are using different techniques and different, uh, there are different problems to be dealt with. Sometimes there are practical problems like privacy, sometimes there are uh, you know, more uh, sort of technical problems, but it's a problem we are, we are working on actively. Some, some uh, systems are much better, some of our products are much better at personalizing to you than others. So, uh, you know, search is very good at returning results that I want to see, and they're different from the ones say, my, my daughter sees when she does the same search, because it knows what I'm going to want. Uh, Google Drive just announced this thing where when you go to Google Drive, it will show you uh, the, the documents or the, power, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, slide decks or whatever that you might want to work on right now, because it's learning what I work on when. And it's actually pretty good. I don't have to go find files, right? So there are things like that that we are doing. Um, the Google Home experience is highly personalized with your voice, uh, again, with opt-in from your side, uh, and so forth. There are others that are hard. Uh, the maps problem is particularly challenging because uh, the users typically don't have a very hard preference. Some do, like, you know, I want to not go on the street. But oftentimes, there are unexpected things like traffic lights and other delays. Uh, and so if you knew that there was going to be, even though this is your favorite road, but there's going to be a five-minute delay because there's an accident or traffic light down, do you still want to go there and so forth. So we're working on those kinds of issues. One thing I will say is that we love feedback. So in every product, there's a send feedback button that goes directly to the teams working on it. And we do read it and we work on it. And I can, you know, I internally... Uh, it's again all anonymized, so I don't know who the user is who fed that uh, data back, but we can see the bug reports and the team's actively working on these things. So if that's something that is bugging you, we would love to hear about it, and we will work on it. But it's, it's uh, certainly getting super personalized is, is sort of the next holy grail, and we are, there, we are further along that process in some products than others. Uh, Lewis Johnson from Alelo. So we used to say in AI that the things that a human child finds very easy to do are precisely the things that an AI have, finds hard to do. And you've been convincing us that maybe that's not true anymore. But I'm curious, from your perspective, what are some of the easy things that your AI still finds difficult, but maybe it will become easier in the next few years? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, there's a long list tell you a couple of my favorites, personal favorites. Um, common sense reasoning is one. Uh, these systems are, you know, systems like Duplex and Assistant are pretty good at conversing with you. They don't necessarily have a lot of common sense about what to tell you at a given time, or, right? Contextual reasoning, right? If I want Google to play me music or find me a path to work uh, or anything else, the context I'm in, am I in a hurry? Do I have a meeting coming up? Do I have enough time to explore? Uh, is it music? Or do I have friends over? Is it by me by myself? Am I having a romantic evening with my spouse? Everything matters, right? And that kind of deeply contextual information is still hard to model. Um, so that's two of them. The third one is actually one I was uh, working on at Park as well. Uh, Shivali's on the same team looking at uh, how these agents can interact with you over a longer period of time in a sensible way. I mean, it's, it's great to be able to book a haircut for you, and it's sort of a short-lived interaction. But over a period of time, if this thing is going to be your assistant and going to live with you and grow with you, right, what does that mean? And how do we sort of solve really long-term temporal personalization? So I think that's another problem that, that is, is critical to get to. So th these are problems where 
in some ways, yes, the system maybe can talk as well as a five-year-old, but it's not always making sense like a five-year-old would. Right? And, and, and so and the, one of the reasons we are looking at, you know, as, as from the product side, things like duplex are done in very specific product areas like booking appointments and making restaurant reservations. Right? But it's still not general purpose human conversation. That problem is still not solved. So we have time for one more, and I want to maybe someone in the back, because we have too many in the, in the front. And I think, Ashwin, you will be around today, right? Yeah, I'm, so I'm here all day and so happy to chat offline. Any, anyone in the back with a question? I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I'm very bad at picking or scheduling the request, so I apologize. Uh, thanks for a nice talk, Peter Brusilovsky, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so the question is, uh, you, most of your talk was about neural networks, but neural networks requires a notorious amount of information to learn. And personalization is a change because you don't have enough time to learn about the user. Uh, so yet, uh, apparently, you solve that issue, right? You tell that Google search is personalized to you, uh, although your user might just search for the very first time. So how you combine this magic of being able to uh, use slow learning, I mean, not slow, fast learning neural network, which requires a lot of data, and user who has very few data provided to the system? It's a great question. So there's, there's the, you know, I, I call it the problem of small data, not big data, right? A lot of cases you have small data. Uh, it might be for a particular user, it might be for a particular entire domain, you may have very little data. Maybe we can do animals, but we haven't done birds yet. Uh, so we're working on a number of techniques. AutoML, for example, actually learns from surprisingly small amount of data. Uh, you can get, if you upload images of birds, you need uh, surprisingly few of them compared to the old style ways of doing things. Um, we use a number of techniques. Uh, some of them are we do a lot of semi-supervised learning where the systems are, uh, some data is supervised, is labeled. There's also other data that's not yet labeled. Uh, we also have systems that generate data, so we use uh, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, where systems are trying to generate data as, as well as learn from the data. Uh, we do transfer learning, where we take a model trained in one domain and apply it. So maybe I don't have data on you, but there is data on a similar set of people that we can determine from your other usage. Maybe you've never used maps before, but we still know enough about you from other things. And we can take that model and transfer it to you. And so it requires much less data to personalize a model starting from a transferred model than starting from ground up. So there's a number of techniques like that.